Welcome to a Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for DramOfOutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series, and anything interesting that falls between. This is podcast episode 165, and it's the first week of the Fiery Cross read along. All right, we're just doing chapter one today. But, 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 first, I think before I begin the opening of the Fiery Cross, I need to address what we didn't see in some form in season four of the television show. I mean, it just finished a week ago. Everybody was all a titter, right? And I went back through the last chapters, and basically six chapters weren't covered in the adapted material. And since Roger returned to River Run instead of the Ridge later, there'll be some changes to the order of things, and surely some scenes will be omitted altogether, right? We know that's going to happen. So what's going to be really interesting as we go through the Fiery Cross is that we still have the character of Duncan Innes to deal with, and there's no Myrta. So it's going to be a bit of a strange ride. <laughs> we don't know. Like one is just in the ether somewhere, and one is a living ghost. So very strange. Okay, so... As a recap of the things that were at the end of Drums of Autumn that didn't get adapted or there was some very minor nod, but nothing more. Okay, so we have Jamie and Brianna's reconciliation, right? Because in Drums, it, they reconciled. They had time before the baby was born and they really worked on that. Uh, Jamie Bonding is a grandfather. He didn't even hold the baby, which is very odd for someone so family-centric. Lord John returning to River Run and traveling with the group until he was to turn toward Virginia. So, he actually was there. And was able to see everybody. Remember, be after... Gosh, I didn't go back through and look, but I think it was after the escapade with Stephen Bonnet and the building blowing up and Lord John got a concussion and he was a mess that he was still in recovery when Jamie and Claire returned. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. It's getting tougher to remember details after watching the series of what's actually in the book. Okay, so he didn't return to River Run. He was there at River Run because he was injured. Roger's oath to the baby and claiming him as his own. He told Brianna, my son. But he didn't actually get to do that in any meaningful way. Roger and Jamie accepting each other. They have a lot to work on still. Roger and Brianna hashing out their feelings and relationship while discovering who each other is now. And really, who doesn't want to see Roger awkwardly stripping down the first time he is in Brianna's intimate space while she breastfeeds the baby? Heck yeah, man. <laughs> I want to see that. I don't know if we're going to get that because of Brianna's greeting of Roger at River Run and passionately kissing him and seeming to be in a not awkward space at all with him. Roger becoming acquainted with his baby. Claire and Jamie's relationship advice to Roger. Because in drums, Roger had to recuperate from a wound he had in the show his arm just magically mended without Claire ever touching it. <laughs> so he had to be on the mend, and Claire had to do some pretty fun stuff, including using leeches on it. It's 
awesome. Oh no, not leeches. Wait, I'm mixing up my surgical memories. <laughs> She used what larva in there, so they would eat all the dead skin. Mmm, and then they would leave because they only eat dead stuff. Yay for Roger's foot! So he had to be convalescing, and Claire and Jamie. As he was recovering, both gave him very different marital advice. The big house being built, according to the set designer, the big house is currently being built right now. <laughs> Joe Costa getting engaged to Duncan Innes.、Mm, Might that be Marta? But this would be for passion. But now he's going to be a wanted guy, so she's not going to be a loyalist. Like, what's going to happen? We don't know. Naming the baby. We didn't see that, and we're going to start off with that. Knowing the baby's name here, which is Jeremiah, after Jamie's father, and they're going to call him Jemmy. The beginning of the gathering at Mount Helican, days one through four. So, what happened in those first four days? So, truthfully, the gathering can be totally truncated. It's a very long bit at <laughs> at the end of drums and at the beginning of the fiery cross. And it's funny because people who've read the book several times are like, "It's eight hundred and seventy four pages. <laughs> It's a third of the book. It's not quite that long, but." We use a little bit of hyperbole when there's something. This book, that part of that could have been edited down a little bit, but it, whatever it is, what it is, and now we have the longest week ever, kind of thing. So, we get an update from young Ian at the beginning of the gathering. So, hopefully, in the show, they'll give us a little flashback. We get Lizzie reuniting with her dad. They found him. Jamie taking the baby gambling, which is one of my favorite things. Claire doctoring people. The Highland Regiment showing up. Roger disclosing the contents of Frank's letter to the Reverend to Jamie. This is one that oh, Rache pointed out that we already know that Frank knew. Well, Brianna knew, and she told Claire. But did Claire tell Jamie that Frank knew that whole time? I hope they didn't have that one little thing totally get rid of this whole scene in season five, because the contents of that letter are so friggin' powerful. I hope that we get it. Jamie making peace with Frank. And the calling of the clans. Yep, because remember, well, in the show they had Brianna walking away from that when they did the calling of the clans, and she got mad at Roger after he had asked him to marry her, and it was a big disaster. So that calling of the clans. Sort of cement them as a family because they're supposed to be getting married at this gathering. It's the first gathering in thirty years in the book, and it's at Mount Helican, which is Grandfather Mountain, which is a real place in <laughs> North Carolina. So there you have it. Sorry, you are hearing my cat being a pest because she wants in the box. So Podcat Butterscotch is being a beast. I will tell you, she spent all day with me. I worked on a final project for eight hours. She probably spent six of that, six and a half of that, next to me or on my lap. So it's not as if she's lacking in mommy time. <laughs> so if it sounds like my box is being infiltrated, it's the cat, and I'm really not in danger. <laughs> okay, so. How do you think the writers will fit this stuff in? How do you think it will be adapted? And what will end up being totally ignored? 
so interesting. Okay, that's a lot of material. And I know some of you are going to say, if they didn't have Brianna wandering and wandering and ending up at Leary's house, we might have been able to get some of this. It's true. We could have. Because some things they like made devastatingly short, like Claire and Jamie's a few days at River Run. So they became no, no part of the community whatsoever. And all the walking and walking and walking and going to get Roger, that took a long time. That probably could have been shown a little bit more expediently so we could have had some of this, right? And the other thing that got left off that I didn't put on this list is the transformation of young Ian into his Kenyan Kahaka self. Where they plucked his hair and tattooed his face. I so hope that they tattoo young Ian in the show. I mean, come on. I want to see it. <laughs> so it's really interesting to think about how this will change because Claire still has this kind of awkwardness because Brianna and Jamie have not reconciled. There's a nod to reconciliation. She spoke of it to Murtaugh, but then we didn't see any of it with Jamie. What, she sat down in between them at dinner? Big whoop. So it's, okay, <laughs> trying to figure that out and where that's going to go. Um, and a couple of people have brought up some of the dropped things from season four, which I thought we should really mention, would be like the settlers going to Fraser's Ridge. You remember they had that major cock block with the whole regulator business. And yeah, what happened to Murtaugh's business, by the way, on top of that business? <laughs> Like, he just left his smithy, and did he sell it? Like, what's going on with that? So that kind of got dropped like a hot tato, as well as where are there settlers? All those settlers who refused to go because it was on the governor's land, the king's land, right? So somebody said they saw a couple extra houses on the pan out, but I didn't remember seeing that. That doesn't really matter. It's the fact that... By this time, they were supposed to be burgeoning with settlers, Scottish settlers that they've brought up to Fraser's Ridge. And we don't have any of that. I mean, they were still living in that damn cabin. We didn't even see the small outbuildings. Maybe the extra cabins that they saw, those were the ones that they put up for like Murtaugh and young Ian and the dog. I don't know. You should see my face. I'm like, what? So... There are some things that were just kind of like beep, thrown off to the wayside and we have no idea. All right. And if you've seen anything about spoilers for season five, I'm not going to talk about it right now. All right. But if you're here, you listen, so you already know it's going to happen. So there's already talk of Stephen Bonnet and the kidnap scene, and that's going to be a little different. Well, of course it's going to be different. What are they going to do? Spend all that time having him take Brianna and dragging her to Ocracoke? I mean, they're not going to do that. He's going to probably come to the ridge and steal her. I don't know. What do you think about that? Email me, contact at adramaoutlander.com. 719-452-3550. I almost gave you my office fax number instead. <laughs> that would have been funny. Okay, now we can move on because I think we had to like clear the air, get cleansed, work our way into the book. Okay, and somebody did ask me if <laughs> I'd had a wee bit of whiskey before the last episode of the podcast. No, I didn't. I was just really excited. I actually overall really liked the finale for lots of reasons and... But you would have heard that podcast already, so it's all good. Okay, so I have been mulling and mulling and mulling. How are we going to approach this entire gigantic book that's going to take us, what, 48 weeks to get through? I'll be seeing you in a year still doing this book. Now, again, my guess is, is that Outlander... Sorry, I was just blowing my husband a kiss that you got to hear. <laughs> He's going to bed. 
that it won't come back until the end of January, maybe February. So we'll see if we can scoot in under that line. If you're looking for the schedule, I will post it on the website, adramaoutlander.com. It's in the Facebook group, and it's on the Facebook page. So, or if you still don't know where to find it, drop me an email or a voicemail, and I'll send it to you. But we're going to be going sometimes one chapter and sometimes multiple chapters. It depends on the length and the content. Really, I've learned after doing many of the read-alongs of the smaller books, the novellas, a couple of the big books, is that really a chapter um, of about 30 to 35 pages max is about as much that can be handled within about an hour of a podcast. Otherwise, it's too much prep and it's like two hours long. Do any of you really want to listen to me for two hours straight? I don't think so. Okay. Now we can move on. So I am thinking what I want to do is really in the chapters that we go through is look at what characters are there, what purpose do they serve, what are kind of the key events that happened, and what are the takeaways, like what kind of like imagery was used or were there callbacks to something else, that kind of thing. I am not an English major. I love books. I go through, I don't know, 35 a year or some 40 a year on top of everything else. However, I'm not perfect and I'm not going to catch all the little things and I don't know what all the nuances are called. <laughs> I don't. Sometimes I look them up because I'm like, what does this mean? I saw this scene and it's got to mean something. And then I'll look it up and tell you. So, yes, this is not the hoity-toity. I'm going to tell you how, every, how she wrote everything. <laughs> It's not an English lesson or a lit lesson. It's really about us looking at the book and drawing things out that might connect to other threads that we've seen before or that are foreshadowing what's coming, things that are intriguing. We wonder why they're there. I like to put interesting links inside the post portion of the podcast, and part of that is so... Why did she decide that this tree was supposed to be here? Does it mean anything? Does it have any any symbolism to it? And so I'll look things up. <laughs> I love that part because then I can kind of go around and pull out these li- little nitty-gritty details that often we don't see if we're just devouring material really quickly. And I really want your input because there's things that you're going to see and remember that I won't. I've gone through the books countless times. No idea. But I'm not somebody who has perfect, exquisite recall. I will have to go back and look things up. I I remember the overview. I remember some things in detail. But I don't have this photographic memory recall. So if I flub something feel free to tell me (laughs) because I'm sure you're going to catch me in it at some point. Okay, so the fiery cross opens with a beautiful epigraph, which I love. So I'm going to read that to start. And I think I'm not going to read things with accents this time unless I can't help myself. I usually do in the read-alongs, and I feel like I do a pretty darn good job, but I don't know if it's like speaking to me this go-round. I have lived through war and lost much. I know what's worth the fight and what is not. Honor and courage are matters of the bone, and what a man will kill for, he will sometimes die for, too. And that, O kinsman, is why a woman has broad hips. That bony basin will harbor a man and his child alike. A man's life springs from his woman's bones, and in her blood is his honor christened. For the sake of love alone would I walk through fire again. Okay, I'm going to tell you something. I 
I'm not excellent trying to parse out what stuff like this means. Just like I can look at art and be like, I know what I like. I know what's beautiful. I know what feeling it evokes in me. I cannot sit there and pull everything out of it that the painter was trying to evoke. I'm the same way with this kind of thing. I don't know why. It's not my superpower. I mean, I know what this means by looking at it, but there's probably things that I'm going to miss in it. So I'm not even going to try <laughs> to break it down. It's fascinating with music. I can pull things out and subtleties and and I see music, actually. I see it in shapes and color when I hear it. And it, I can feel it in a way that I can't look at a painting and understand why there's a significance in this particular landscape. Like, what is it saying? It's pretty. <laughs> I love art, but I'm very dumb about it. <laughs> I'm just a viewer. <laughs> okay, part one, in medius rays. So the first chapter is called Happy the Bride, the Sun Shines On. And this is from a Scottish proverb. And the next part of that is Blessed are the dead that the rain rains on. So for a wedding, you want sunshine. For a funeral, you want rain. There you have it. <laughs> and like Jamie waking up dead at the beginning of Voyager, I love the opening paragraph. I woke to the patter of rain on canvas with the feel of my first husband's kiss on my lips. I blinked, disoriented, and by reflex, put my fingers to my mouth to keep the feeling or to hide it. I wondered, even as I did so. Great opening paragraph. Okay. So the setting is Mount Helican, the Royal Colony of North Carolina, late October 1770. Now remember, they didn't get back to the ridge until, what, July? They weren't there very long to get things planted and put back together. They were gone for many, many months. In the book, they didn't seem to be gone as long as they were on the show. And I have decided I'm not going to be uber legalistic because there are some things that as we're going through this material, we're going to have to go, how is this going to happen? So at the end of each podcast... I'm going to put in my own like conjecture about how I think they're going to deal with it. And I want to hear back from you how you think the scenes will be handled. Will they be adapted? Will they just like kick it to the curb and not use it at all? All right. Now, one of the things I really, really hope we get, because in the first five minutes, I sat down to read this. I remembered... Why? I love these people so much. Claire's internal dialogue is amazing most of the time. And we get to really see her as being this unreliable narrator. She's really funny. And she often thinks one thing and does another. Like she tells herself stuff, but totally ignores what she's telling herself, right? I love that. Like, how are we going to get that scene? Are we going to get like a little flashback of Tobias and her kissing on their wedding day or wedding night? I don't know. But I remember in the first season, they got hammered for so many voiceovers, but not doing any is really making it difficult to connect to that inner voice because it's so plentiful. Um, Roger's inner voice they used with him talking to the other captive until he died. <laughs> okay. So the Latin phrasing means 
into the middle of things. It usually describes a narrative that begins not at the beginning of a story, but somewhere in the middle, usually at some crucial point in the action. All right. There you have it. So who are the characters in this chapter? We see Claire, we got Ghost Frank, Jamie, Roger, Brianna, Jemmy, Marsley, Fergus, Jermaine, the 67th Highland Regiment, the man in charge of it, Lieutenant Archibald Hayes, Lizzie and her hormones, Duncan Innes, the weather. The weather is prevalent in this chapter about how cold, about how wet, about how uncomfortable. Where did Claire's petticoat go? Mm. Okay. <laughs> that should be a character as well. <laughs> but it's late October, so it's definitely rainy and cold and fall has fallen upon them. So what is Claire doing in this chapter? Well, first of all, she's trying to get rid of Ghost Frank, who's in her head. <laughs> and the night before, oh yes, this is the other thing. The night before, Jamie had given her back Frank's ring. Remember he kept it after it was disclosed that Bonnet was the rapist in the books. We kind of forget that now because they use the other ring. They use Jamie's key instead as the bait. And in the books, Jamie had kept it. And he had given it back to Claire when they were fireside the night before. That happened at the end of drums also. So there's this confluence of things going on with Claire in order to have these kind of dreams. She's planning Brianna's wedding. Joe Costa and Duncan are getting married as well. So they've got wedding on the brain, number one. Number two... Frank is obviously not able to be at Brianna's wedding. So is he just kind of knocking on her subconscious or did she think of him first? And she was thinking of wedding nights. So she was kissing Frank and her dream. This really unsettles her. So those things are going on as well as all these other logistical things. I swear they must have gotten up. Okay, it's fall. I don't know what time the sun comes up in late October in North Carolina, but I'm sort of presuming it's not 5 a.m. So that she's up before dawn. I'm thinking it had to be somewhere around 5 a.m. that she woke up and desperately wanted coffee, but it would require way too much work. <laughs> and she snuggles up to Jamie, right? And she's thinking, oh... I'll get a little loving in, and that will erase Frank. She wants to reconnect with Jamie to tell the ghost to go away. <laughs> but she has these other things like making breakfast. Now, one of the things in the books is that Claire is not, like, the most awesome cook. She can do very basic things. It is not something she enjoys doing, just like she doesn't enjoy doing all the sewing and washing and all of that. She could find better things to do. I hear you, Claire. <laughs> so Jamie keeps inviting people for breakfast. So what time are they going to eat breakfast? Maybe seven, eight. They have a lot to do. There's going to be two weddings and all this stuff going on. So I'm thinking when they got the commotion of the regiment waking them, everybody up, it was probably around 7 a.m. I have no idea. I'm totally stabbing in the dark just to make a legitimate guess about how long this day five is going to be. <laughs> it's going to be long. I'm telling you, you're going for a ride. It's the longest 24 hours ever. So they had to have started really, really early. And people went to bed when it got dark. So they legitimately would get up really early. So Claire is trying to figure out breakfast, and it's in her head. 
and she's thinking about Brianna's wedding dress and this not being the wedding that she had thought she would have and all those kind of things are going through her mind. And so this is just about them going about their daily business and she has like a clinic time for morning as well after breakfast. I'm like, you're going to feed 24 people and go do your clinic time. All right then, no problem. So then we have Frank's ghost. All right, so Frank is bugging (laughs) Claire and... She has a naughty dream with him. And when she thinks about Roger claiming the baby as his own, you know, he's a good man. And I like how Frank interjects, oh, you think so, do you? (laughs) I was like, yay, that's so funny. That's the thing about Frank. Some people complain, oh, it's only about Jamie and Claire. No, it's not. How boring. And Frank never leaves us throughout these books. See, unlike Leary, who I think is herpes in the books, Frank is this, to me, I know not all you agree, is this interesting presence that keeps coming back. And people ask all the time, well, why did Claire keep wearing his ring? Because they meant a lot to each other, because they raised a daughter together, because he was a good man. No matter what anybody thinks, he was a good man. Like I've always said, if he cheated, I don't blame him at all. Claire participated in that by being distant and staying fiercely in love with Jamie Fraser when she went back to the 20th. She was emotionally cut off from him. And in the books, they maintained having a physical relationship off and on. They made it work. Made it work. So Frank is there. And then Claire gets rid of him. But then she thinks, maybe I'll touch the ring when they get married. You know, maybe I can just like send him like he'll get to see her somehow. I love that. Because even though she's irritated that he's showing up and bugging her, she still has that space of compassion and kindness and regard for him and what he meant to Brianna, what he meant to her life. Okay. The other thing that Claire was up to, my favorite thing, after she went and changed the dirty baby. (laughs) is she got a few minutes to herself just by the water, inhaling that peace and that sanity before having to go back into the fray. Because it was when that part where she was saying, though she loves to socialize and get caught up and get everybody's news, it's just so much. Yeah, that's how I feel. I love to socialize. I want to hear about people's lives. I want to catch up. But it's a lot. And then I need quiet. I need my own space. And I think when my kids were really young, I was able to just do everything and not feel so tired by every by life. But as the responsibilities and kind of the burdens of life grew and all these years have passed. Oh my gosh, I totally need what I needed when I was a little kid. <laughs> I needed as a teenager. Like it's all come back full circle and I can't just push through anymore because everything that I do requires so much emotional energy that there's no reserve. It's amazing and interesting to think about that. Okay, so what's Jamie up to? Well, the first thing we see is Jamie getting woken up from a dream. And he was dreaming about someone being crowned the king of Ireland. And the whole process, which entails mm, having intercourse with a horse. 
And all these mishaps kept happening, and the man who would be king, for some reason, they couldn't make it work. So Jamie was going to show him how it's done. <laughs> oh, and and Clara's like, oh, well, I'm so sorry for waking you up. Like that humor, like she thought it was hilarious. I was kind of goading him. It was, I love that part. <laughs> But Jamie is kind of in the middle of things with Archie Hayes, who was a Jacobite, who ended up joining the British Army because they gave him the opportunity. And then he rose in ranks to be an officer from nothing. So he's done very well for himself, and he's made the best of what he has. But Archie Hayes read this letter from Tryon about this regulator business because in a small town, there was this huge problem, and the town was vandalized and... There are people injured, and Jamie knows that there's people there, so does Claire, that actually participated in those kind of riots, as we would think of them now. And he wanted people to come to his tent and tell them information. Really, okay. Now, Duncan Innes happened to be in that town when it happened, and so they were making sure the men that they knew were gone by nighttime. So if Duncan was directly asked, he could say, no, none of the men are here, which is good. Because Jamie's like, mm-mm, I'm not turning anybody in. The other part of what Jamie's doing is he's still really concerned about Roger's ability to take care of a family in the 18th century. It's only been a few months since he and Brianna have been back together, and he doesn't know how to build things. Okay, he's a musician and a historian professor. <laughs> I would say those are probably not excellent skills for the 18th century mountain survival. <laughs> so he, Roger's really starting from scratch. He has to relearn how to do everything. He has to navigate this sketchy relationship he has with his father-in-law. It takes a while for them to build, like, a really solid rapport. He and Brianna are still working on things. So Jamie's got to work through those doubts, but he's doing it. So Roger is getting ready for his wedding and... The only thing that we know about what he's doing is he nearly cuts himself very badly when the drum started. So he has this straight edge gash and Jamie had to give him a coat in order to wear with his kilt. Oh, I hope we get kilts. It was very odd not seeing any kilt in season four. I was bummed out about that. So we should see a whole host of kilts at <laughs> the gathering. So Roger's busy doing that. That's all we see about Roger. Okay. Brianna. So the baby's, what, six months old, roughly-ish, teething, normal stuff. And Brianna is trying to get her stuff together for the wedding. That's all she's really doing. We don't, we only see them for an instant and they're out, but we know that they're there and that they're planning on actually having a marriage by a priest that Jocasta brought in from Maryland. We don't see Jocasta, but we know she's there. <laughs> she's supplying the food for the weddings and the priest, and she keeps letting Claire and Jamie borrow from her coffers to feed the people who come to their little campsite. So we see Marsley, Fergus, and Jermaine. 
And that comes in when Germain, like the little maniac he is, Germain, runs off and ends up getting himself fallen into the water. And he is saved by a bayonet hooking (laughs) his clothes and dragging him up. (laughs) So Fergus feels ingratiated to the soldier, so invites him to breakfast. (laughs) He's a nice kid, nice Scottish boy. And Marcely is busy with the baby, and it's just mayhem. It's they're just controlled chaos of young parenthood. And so I love that part. <laughs> so we're kind of seeing what's just the vibe of what's going on at the gathering. And again, we have the Highland Regiment and Archibald Hayes. Nobody's going to talk to Hayes, but he's really smart. He backed up his tent to where somebody could come in to the back and give him information and sneak back out if they wanted. So it's super clever. But we also learn that that regiment is going to be disbanded as soon as they get back to Scotland and that they were supposed to leave already. They just happened to still be in North Carolina. So Tryon used them to go to the gathering. I mean, they're Scots. They're familiar. They know people there. But when they get back to Scotland, they're going to be going their own way. I mean, he might get a different job, but the soldiers will be dispersed back to their homes. So anything that he's doing there is really this last minute convenience. He's not really going to be deeply going after people because they're supposed to be leaving the next day and heading to a ship to go back to Scotland. And then we see Duncan Innes, who's supposed to be getting married to Joe Costa. He was like, in and out. Hey, Duncan. Like, we know he's there. And again, the weather. Rainy. And so Jamie says that proverb. And (laughs) it's like, don't you say that to Brianna today. (laughs) Okay, okay. But it's just, imagine, drizzly, gray, windy and cold that it's coming off of the mountain and biting you under your skirts. All right. So that's kind of who we saw, what they were doing. So we've embarked again on the longest days ever in the history of any gathering, (laughs) specifically this 24 hours. Uh, Brianna makes a diaper pin. This is where we start to see Brianna's cleverness. And in the books, she makes stuff all the time where she realizes she's really an engineer, right? That's what we figured out before. But she took hot metal and twisted it, and then Roger carved tops, and they glued it on using hoof glue and milk paste, something like that, which they would fall off all the time. It's not going to be that secure. But they actually have diaper pins for the diapers, even though Claire was like bemoaning plastic covers and wishing she had them. So that's really what's happening. It's going on. And we're just getting the the feel of the end of this gathering is coming to the marriages are supposed to happen and then they get to go back to the ridge and this is where kind of life really begins again because they had to leave all the work that they really needed to do to spend the couple weeks traveling so what sort of takeaways did i have again claire's inner monologue i really miss Jamie and Claire's warmth and humor. Love those. I just... The dimension of the characters in the books. Like you really get... I could really feel how cold Claire's feet were. I didn't have to see it. I knew she was shivering. When Jamie asked where her petticoat, her nice wool one went, well, they used it to make more diapers for the 
babies for Marsley's too. For Jemmy, she's Clara's like the weather; it doesn't dry, and we're running out. And Lizzie started her period, <laughs> so she's all hormonal. She got her period at the gathering, so she needed something. So she didn't bleed everywhere. So Clara's like sacrificed her woolen under <laughs> underskirt to make sure that everybody was taken care of. But I could feel just the coolness of the leaves and the drool of the baby and the mayhem of Germain. You know, all of that stuff is so vibrant. And it's interesting because I know in books it just brings it to life in a different way and it's our own images that we bring up and they project into our mind. But on screen, I'm looking at how some of these things are going to play out. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be able to feel that unless they show her cold feet. (laughs) Or it's too literal. Are they going to have Brianna being this mad engineering genius? We did get to see her artistic work a bit in season four, which I liked. But we're going to get to see her inventing things, inventing in quotes, making things from later that she figures out how to do now for conveniences. You know, what other characters are going to be introduced? I mean, I wonder what life on the ridge is going to be like when we get back to the show next year. It's going to be fascinating. So this is all build up to the weddings, but with this regiment here, that kind of spells a little bit of trouble. Makes you wonder what's going to happen because they talked about the wedding several times. And so it makes me wonder if someone's going to try and block it, make it difficult. If the priest isn't going to be able to do what he's supposed to do. I'm not sure. Well, actually, I do totally know. I'm lying to you. But if you've not read this before, you don't know what's going to happen. So I'm not going to tell you. Okay. So we're just encroaching on this book. And I'm really glad that I went over the things in the last six chapters kind of in a quick manner. So we would know where we were starting. Because coming out of the TV show, when I sat down and started reading, it was like, being shocked because we spent all that time in drums and then we watch the show and you get immersed in that and then you're coming back to the books and going what just happened (laughs) I'm in some kind of other universe I don't know what's happening and that's exactly what we're doing we have to spend some time transitioning back into the book universe and we're going to get there but I love the textures I was so excited to sit down and people are all like, boo-hoo, it's Droughtlander. I'm like, wahoo, it's Droughtlander. We get to go back to the books. That's awesome. And we get to try and figure out what's going to happen on the TV show. So I'm not going to be so legalistic about keeping them totally separate. And we'll just put a little bit, like right now, I'm going to go, okay. So... What do I think they're going to put in from this chapter? They probably will have Claire and Jamie being cock blocked because season four was kind of a big cock block, wasn't it? <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of loving going on. I mean, at least on screen. I think they'll probably do away with the kid antics to where we actually see it. Like we might see it in the opening scene where Fergus is chasing after Germain and but and then the, the card comes up or the title of the episode comes up. I don't think that Archibald Hayes is going to read this excessively long letter. It'll probably be done in a different way. 
We don't have Duncan Innes. So is Joe Costa getting married? I don't know. Huh. Because we still have that regulator issue to deal with. And it was a big deal in North Carolina. Someone got upset with me for saying I was done with it. It's because they, it was so in your face. And when there's only minutes, minutes of every episode, and they're precious minutes, it seemed like it was a lot, a lot. But I know it was serious in the history of North Carolina. <sighs> okay. And they're probably going to do away with the Jamie inviting everybody to breakfast out of Scottish courtesy. <laughs> and we're probably not going to get his dream about becoming the King of Ireland. <laughs> so what I hope we get from this chapter is Claire and Frank having that conversing thing, however they can do it. I would love that because he's really important to the rest of the story. And I hope they put in from the missing material, like Claire's not getting that ring back because it never disappeared, but Roger talking to Jamie about that letter. Somehow, somehow that needs to be in there. Because even though they knew Frank knew, they don't know that Frank put that headstone. They don't know any of the stuff except that he knew. So I hope so, because it explains a lot more about Frank's character. So I, I'm, I'm wishing. <laughs> And I think the letter from young Ian, the update, will be done in, we'll get to see an update on him at the Mohawk Village. So I, what do you think? There's a lot of material. And that's a big jump forward from where they were. We don't even know that there's a gathering happening. Oh, no, Jamie needs to hunt down Murtaugh and kill him. <laughs> okay. So I hope they fit in that relational stuff and not just have it be some kind of action. I was expressing to somebody recently, and I probably said on the last podcast, I don't remember, but the difference in shows that are character driven, regardless of the story, if they keep a basic format, it's fine, like Shetland and Vera. They're, it's fine because it doesn't really matter what the mystery is that they're solving, what the case is they're solving. What matters is their characters in that process. And we get to see them, even though they're, little, they're different than we expect, the essence is there. They're brilliant. So it doesn't matter if it's all new material or book material or whatever. But Outlander has a depth to it. And that's why when I got through five minutes of reading, I was like, oh, I love you guys. Hello. That's how I felt. I felt like I was stepping into the presence of old friends. I have people I've known forever. I've known them for more than half my life. Yep. <laughs> so thinking of that... I am so ecstatic to be going through this. And I wonder in the storytelling on the show, I know they've had lots of changes in writers. I wish they would keep a solid team that would just get in a groove and do it. Because I really felt like in season four, we got a lot of hits and misses and we got some amazing stuff, but it wasn't consistent. And you have to be able to show... The, what's going on underneath? What are those dynamics? The subtleties. And I, some of it we got beautifully. And then others, it just felt like flat. It didn't make any sense. Like some of the choices, Roger leaving Brianna. 
we're all just like, well, he is kind of a dick, isn't he? <laughs> like, why? You've gone through all this hardship and you're just going to like walk out. Huh. Even though you came back in a few hours, whatever. And I can see why people were mad about that. So I wonder how they're going to bring in some of these things and the relational stuff and like hit the ground running because we really need to see that travel time to the ridge. We need to see the reconciliations. We need to see that rebuild of relationships. And I think the gathering really could be done in one episode, truthfully, the whole thing. Because they could just have it like, show a little bit, show a little bit from the first days, and then have this one be, or not this chapter, but this final day, be the, be the episode. And then we can move on. But we really need to have some of that stuff prior, because if they do it to where it's like the way Voyager started in the book where it's a total, like, cold open, where you're like, where the hell are we? and What happened? Because <laughs> that's how Diana wrote it. You don't know what's happening. Well, they've already done that on the show. So I hope they don't, like, jump ahead and then be like, five months ago, and give us the backstory I hope they start back at River Run with them trying to figure out what to do with Murtaugh and going and then being back at the ridge. I don't want to see two weeks of travel. That's how long it takes. But I hope that we actually see that connection because I think it's going to be important to the movement of this story because they just stopped it at a location that you're like, well, it makes sense, but now there's a lot to be done before we can be at this day at the gathering. Okay. So what do you think of this chapter? What do you think it's leading to? What are your comments about how this might be integrated into the show? And the six chapters of things that were missing that I went over. I'm giddy right now. Just giddy with excitement that we are going to be with our friends for an entire year in this book. I hope you can stand me for a whole year because I'm going to be able to stand you. I just know it because you're awesome. But send me the feedback. Contact at adramofoutlander.com or 719-425-9444. Did I give you the other number? Okay, so the real call in line is 719-425-9444. If I said another number, 452 number, that's my fax number. <laughs> Can you tell I've been doing schoolwork all day? Hey, but the good news is it got graded quickly, and I got 100% on it. One more class down, keeping my 4.0 going. That's why this is late, so I apologize. But... You all aren't going to give me a bad grade if I have something that's late. <laughs> I got to keep the momentum, people. <laughs> all right. So what are we doing next week? Next week, we are doing Chapter 2, Loaves and Fishes. <laughs> In the Drama of Outlander group on Facebook, I've started an event for people to go in and put comments, thoughts about the chapter before I do the podcast. Okay? Because that way I can include those things in the podcast. So go and join it. You have to answer some questions so we know that you're a real human and that you're not some, like, angry troll beast from under a bridge <laughs> or a bot of some sort. But head over there. And if you're not on social media, you can certainly email me any thoughts or comments you have on the chapter before I record. I'm generally going to record on Saturdays. That's my goal. 
but babies sometimes don't care about my podcasting goals. <laughs> Just like they don't care about my school goals, and I have to turn things in late because I'm tending to a mom and baby at a home birth. <laughs> okay. But the schedule, again, is on the Facebook page and group. I will make a post on the website that has it on there as well. And again, if you want me to email it to you, I will do that also. The other thing I'm going to be doing during the read-alongs is as the medical things come up or the sciencey things come up that I love, I will be doing an additional few minutes of the Outlander Science Club. It's coming back. The reason I didn't do it for the TV show is, frankly, they just didn't do en enough with what Claire's does. I mean, I could have done with all the herbs growing in her kitchen, but we really didn't get to see Claire at work very much again. It was all about on horses trying to find Roger. <laughs> and I did talk about the surgery at the theater on the show. So I will be doing a little short extra for Outlander Science Club. I'm starting that again, and hopefully Outlander Medicine will join me again with doing those because, of course, she's an actual physician, so she's going to have some different insights than I will, no matter how great my research tools and skills are. <laughs> okay, so dramaoutlander.com is the website, Facebook page and group, a Dram of Outlander, go figure. Twitter and Instagram, it is Dram of Outlander without the A in the front. And patreon.com slash a Dram of Outlander if you would like to offer a monthly something as little as a dollar to help me take care of the podcast and all the things that go into it. Or if you'd like to financially help and make a one-time offering, then you can just email me or leave me a voicemail, and I will tell you how to do that. Because every dollar counts, and I appreciate you, and it's so gracious of you guys to be offering me any kind of financial support for this. And one of the think goals I have during the read-along is that I want to have some fun, a dram of Outlander things to give away to you. We're going to do some little contests. Yeah, maybe some trivia contests or something. I'm not sure yet. If you have ideas for what some kind of fun things that we can do, let me know. Because I want to hear it from you. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Somehow I got to an hour. Not sure how. <laughs> but we did. So thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on this journey. And we're going to get through the fiery cross. There's some tough stuff in this book, like in every book. And I'm going to do my best to handle it really well for you guys. And until next time, slangeva.